Hello ladies and gents, hope you're all well. And for our little venture today, we start off back in the past. Normally we go from present to past, but we're doing it the opposite way around today. This lovely drawing by A.B. Gilderson, circa 1800, which shows the Pool of Barking, more commonly known as Barking Quayside. If you look over to the left, note the old Quayside building there. And if you look towards the centre, Note St Margaret's Church Tower. Bear those in mind because we will be seeing them again in our past venturings and when we venture off into the future. They are important parts of this tour, so keep them in mind. The town which once boasted the largest fishing fleet in the world is now unknown as a fishing port. Barking, however, has a long history of fishing. The Thames was a fishery centre in the earliest days favourable to both shellfish and whitefish, and the proximity of the country's largest centre of population played a large part in its success. Fishing villages were to be found all along the shores of the Thames, supplying not only local markets, but also riverside markets in London, including Billingsgate Market, which is of Roman origin itself. Barking and its major role in fishing can be traced from the Doomsday Book right up to its decline in the late 19th and through to the early 20th century. The quayside would once have been filled with fishing smacks just like this. And this is a sketch by D.S. Pat Patterson and it gives an idea of what an early 19th century smack would have looked like. So you can imagine a very, very busy quayside hustling and bustling with boats and smacks and fishermen. It was a real hive of industry, one my own ancestors were a part of, the Maywood side of my family, which I've mentioned before. They were eel fishermen and women, and this would have been their world as well. Local records show that there were 23 smack owners in Barking in 1805, and that between them they owned 40 smacks. Now here are their names and details and things, so pause to read if you want. I'll stay on each of these little images for a little while. It was into this world that Scrimgore Hewitt 1765 to 1850 had moved in about 1795. His father, Dr Alexander Hewitt, died in Scotland in 1773 and his mother moved to, <coughs> moved to London with six children six months later from Cupar in Fifeshire. Scrimgore went to the West Indies for a number of years before returning to London. He was reputed to have been sent at some stage to look after some property belonging to his aunt at Dagenham, but this land has not been traced. Like his father before him, Samuel Scrimgor, or Hewitt, Samuel Hewitt, went into the fishing and fishing smack industry. Scrimgor had several children, of whom something is known, of some of them. The eldest, Fleming, became a banker, the second son, Samuel, who we see here, was born on the 7th of December, 1797. Apparently, his father, Scrimgur, would have liked him to go into banking as well, but Samuel had different ideas. While Scrimgur was away at the war, the Napoleonic War, in the fishing smack of the Fifeshire, Samuel ran away to sea in one of the other smacks. Consequently, on his return, his father Scrimgur had the boy apprenticed to himself. The indenture is dated the 3rd of April 1812, so Samuel was 16 years old at the time. There is a record in the Press Protection Ledger that Samuel enjoyed protection from the press as a fishing apprentice aboard the Fleming in January 1812, some months before his indenture. Now, protection from the press, being press ganged, where you might be having a drink in a pub and someone will buy you a drink. 
and you would drink it and in the bottom of that tankard you would find a shilling and it was known as the king's shilling and you had literally just drunk your way into the army or navy no ifs buts or maybes other press gang people were far more ruthless you might be cuddled over the head and wake up on board a ship and discover that you'd been press ganged and if you refuse to work well it may not go well for you and that's the Hewitts and their involvement in the short blue fleet which was the fishing fleet really one of them of its time off barking and that's these two men's role that they played in it and we will be seeing their graves soon but now for some historical in images of barking quayside before i drag us back off into the present and the modern barking era and quayside um this is the barking quayside late 19th century and as i said it is a busy hive of industry even then you can see over to the left the quayside building do bear that in mind Pretty much everything else, all the little cottages and buildings that run along the quayside wall, they're all gone. And indeed, they were gone by 1907, the majority of them. You see this image here, you've got the quayside building and Barking St Margaret's. Now they're the only two buildings from this image that still exist for us to see from this spot in our own time. And that's where you're going to join me now. So off we go back into the present. I shall drag us kicking and screaming. And off we go. Hello ladies and gents. And welcome back to the present. And if you remember our last image that we left off in 1907. We're matching that exact image up. The only two things remaining from that time, in our own time, are the old key building over to the left here, and St Margaret's there, and Barking Key itself. And as I said in our opening images, Barking Key once hosted the world's largest fishing fleet, the Short Blue Fleet. Mr. Scrimgore will be visiting his last resting place in a minute, but this is the modern day Barking Quayside. This wall here is an old wall and has been well repaired to incorporate it into modern times, but where we're standing here is all modern flood defences, as we'll find out soon. But you can just see a, a sunken little boat or hulk there. Bless its heart. But we're going to go up these stairs and past the Boat Welfare Centre to something fairly nice. Which is this. I'll say that for it. Nice, but windy. <coughs> oh, crumbs, as my nan would have said. <coughs> if any of you ladies and gents watched the pocket history of Barking and Dagnum, we all remember this place because I showed it then and it is a place that I don't really show enough on my page or pages the um, first time I showed it was the pocket history of Barking and Dagnum although I've come here a good number of times myself so I like this area even if it is windy <coughs> but yeah but in the pocket history of Barking and Dagnum the triple uh, two restaurant that you can see there that was its opening day and you could hear a man playing the mandolin very very well where we're going is just over here because there's historical information and modern day information all combined into one <coughs> my 
my nose is running like Usain Bolt. It really is. It's really cold and wet. going over here. We may be blown to the feet of Luca and back again but the old key building <coughs> protecting you from flooding. New flood defences have been put in along the side of Highbridge Road. This is Highbridge Road in the 1920s. This is the new steel piling flood defences, which goes along there. It's Highbridge Road. And this is it all. It's new stuff. Flooding in Barking. Some people can still remember when the fields next to the Abbey flooded and people had to take boats to work. The old stone wall you can see, that's the one I pointed out that I said had been repaired. Um, you can see, to stop flooding, but now, uh, sorry, the old stone wall you can see was to stop flooding, but now new improved flood defences have been put in with a 100 year design life and the old wall repaired so it doesn't collapse. So that's the old stone wall along, along there. So that's, one of the only really original parts of the quayside. Let's get back to here. Another historical image that you can see Barking St Margaret's and it's got its two bridges which it's got modern equivalents of, one of which we just crossed. An overview from history. The picture above shows four gates and six gates bridges on Highbridge Road in 1832. The quay was probably created when the river walls along the river roading were breached and the area flooded, creating a natural harbour site. In the 1700s and 1800s, slaughterhouse waste and sewage were brought into the quay as fertiliser for market gardens. This gave Barking a reputation for pollution and bad smells. Even so, local children regularly used to swim here. Oh, I see. How come? And you've got healthy rivers mean healthy people. Purple looser strife, grey wagtail and teasel. New terraces and mud banks should work over time to cleanse the water and create a more beautiful and healthy river for people to enjoy, as well as a habitat for key species like grey wagtails and for nectar plants like purple looser strife and teasel. The river has been very polluted in the past, causing health problems for people and loss of wildlife habitat. Now we have the chance to reverse the damage done. The changing shape of the key. The blue on this map shows how big the key used to be. Over time, buildings were extended out into the river, shrinking it to a rectangular shape. This was sometimes done by using barges full of gravel as foundations. So. I don't think that barge there is one of those, but you never know. Poor sunken thing. Right, but you are going to join me first at Barking St Margaret's at the grave of Mr Hewitt, the uh, founder of the, the short blue fleet. Then you're going to join me over here later on in the evening after church and that's a little nod to the past that was created in our own time um, not what we're looking at where we're going to be going this is Barking Town Hall Tower that we're looking at and right at its foot is as I say a nod to the past created in our own time which is a nod to the old Barking Town Square so that's where you'll join me after we go and pay our respects to Mr Hewitt so off we go to Barking St Margaret's first and then off here afterwards so join me at both of those fantastically interesting locations. See you all soon. Hello again ladies and gents, you join me at Barking St Margaret's in its churchyard at the Hewitt family tomb 
one that's been restored over years and several times. I won't cover too much of the modern stuff, but it's the, uh, the family vault. The family vault is now in Barking Cemetery. That's Ripple Road. That's where the family are buried. Once they banned further burials here. Um, sacred to the memory of Scrimgore Hewitt, of this parish and of the short blue fleet, who departed this life June the 17th, 1850, born 1769, son of Alexander Hewitt of Cooper, Fife, also of his wife Sarah Hewitt, Wennell, bear that name in mind, died 1811, aged 44 years, and of four of their infant children, also of Thomas Hewitt, who died in 1861, aged 55, also Samuel Hewitt, of the short blue fleet, died 1871, aged 73 years, son of Scrimgore Hewitt, and of his wife Anne Hewitt, made a name Moorhead, died 1841, aged 42 years, and it goes on, of five of their infant children, also of Anne, wife of George Fabery, sorry, no, Fayra, F A Y R E R, their daughter died 1848, aged 28 years. Also of Clarissa Han Hancock Hewitt, maiden name Levitt, second wife of Samuel Hewitt, born 1811, died 1890, and of four of their infant children, and of Clarence John Hewitt, born 1857, died in 1859. <coughs> This is the family coat of arms. But our two men of main interest. Scrimgore Hewitt of the Short Blue Fleet and his son Samuel, whose images you saw in our opening piece. And this is their last resting place. So another little integral piece of Barkin's history they certainly were. Um, once again, at Barking St Margaret's. There's a lot tied to this place, isn't there? A hell of a lot. And as I say, you are now going to join me after church, later on, over there. So, I hope you all found this bit interesting. Join me over there. You join me in the <clears throat> modern day Barking Market East Street, and we go around the back of this little insalubrious alleyway that does smell a piss goes around the back of Iceland <clears throat> and as I said this is a, a hark back or a nod to the past using bits of the past Barking Town Square before all this lot was either swept away by slum clearances or blown away by the Second World War was where we're going now and in 2015 to as a, a nod to the past and to cover the ugliness of the back of Iceland, which isn't a pretty sight from the town hall here, which is a lovely art deco kind of era building, 1920s, 30s, very much of that style. And we come out here, look, you get the Barking Town Hall Christmas tree, which looks very nice, do like a bit of Christmas, must say. And then we come to this, our little nod to the past, which is Barking Folly. This was created in 2015, using all old and reclaimed materials. So, this is where the old Barking Town Square was, and this was designed as a nod to the old Barking Town Square, at the old brick layout of the town, as it was originally years ago. Um, this was built by modern day architects and students and they've done a very good job. If you look up the top there. Oops. Got a ram. That's better. You've got a ram up there.
and then in these alcoves this is wr 1862 as i say this is all reclaimed materials is it gonna work or not we are playing up i think it's the cold it doesn't like it but yeah you've got these things in the niches here and the old tiles as well which i like And this really does look like a genuine thing, doesn't it? It's even got like the old bricked up bit for a cellar, which I think is brilliant. And using all old traditional stuff. Some of these bricks are um, salvaged and reclaimed from the old town. So they're bits and bobs that they had lying around. And also these stone things, it doesn't say where all of it came from, but a nice little nod to Barking's past. And in your archetypical sense of a folly, make sure there's no rats because you've got a rat catcher thing there around there and it's normally full of them around here. So you've got this carving up there which is pretty impressive too. Two figures and it's all blocked together very well. But what it hides is quite amusing really. It hides from the town hall over there the ugliness of this door is a faux door it doesn't it just takes you behind the back of the folly which is not really anything there <laughs> as we're going to see so that folly hides the ugliness of the back of Iceland's here and if you see look it is just faux there's just nothing there really you can get up onto the, the walkway things, but yeah, I wouldn't bother trying to get in there. I mean, it's not really much there. But yeah, it's a, it's a folly and it hides Iceland's really, which quite clearly the, the town hall didn't like or want to see. So, <laughs> yeah, that's Barking Town Folly. You had a little bit of the past and a little bit of the present. And that's uh, an update, really, on what we've all, what we've been up to recently. There's a hell of a lot to be hitting the page. You've got Christmas churches, you've got Eastbury Manor, Valance House Museum, the Pocket History of Barkingham Dagenham, which is four thousand years in less than an hour, which is this what you're watching? Um, what, no, it isn't actually. This isn't a separate thing. You know what I mean? But yeah, so there's a lot to go on. I do get muddled up with some of it sometimes because. Having a bit of free time towards Christmas, I got a lot done. So yeah, you've got some nice churches, Valence House Museum, Dagenham Village, or what remains of it. It's church and a lovely old pub, so there'll be a lot to hit the page. And in the pocket history of Barking and Dagenham, when you do watch it, you can think back of all the people that we've seen and visited in our tours, and the Barking and Dagenham that they would have known. So, I hope you've all found this interesting. Thanks very much for watching.